as a church, we believe in seasons, eh? because there is a season, the Bible says, for, any, for, for everything. There is day, and there is night. There is winter, and there is autumn, there is spring, and there is summer. You can see, in God, in his wisdom, has given us seasons. For those of us who live in countries that, have don't, that don't have these seasons, we have dry and we have rainy seasons. Uh, we have two seasons, but still, we have seasons. Uh, and everything that you see in this world, or that God has made in this earth, on this earth, is according to seasons. And therefore, it is wise for us also as a church to have a system of seasons where we pray and seek the face of God and say, God, in this season, what do you want us to do? What is our role as a church? Eh? We are not the only church on this island. There are many churches. But we have a role to play in God's plan for this nation and in God's plan for this world. Each church has its own calling and specific calling. And in each church, each individual, the Bible says, has his own calling as well. So the Bible says that we are a body. And we are members of that body. And this year, our focus would be building this local church. Uh, creating for it an identity of its own. And within that, disciple, uh, discipleship, teaching, training, equipping people to be, be better able to serve God, whether in this community or wherever that God would lead them. And we believe that God is using us in this direction this year. But we cannot just train anyone, we cannot just teach and disciple anyone unless they are willing to be part and parcel of us. And today I want to use the time to clarify what I mean by, and those of you who are mature Christians today, bear with me and be patient with me. Um, to clarify on the concept of membership. Why do you say to me, become a member of a church? Am I not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ? Isn't that enough? There are some Christians who don't believe in church membership. Or who do not think that the Bible talks about church membership. You would not find in the Bible and you shall become a member of a church. So can you not find a verse in the Bible which says you should not smoke a cigarette. <laughs> there are so many things that we don't do that you won't find in the Bible. However, we can look at the Bible and we can get principles out of it as to why. And I think when you start to talk about church membership, people get afraid. And it's true that people get afraid because the membership of the church has been abused throughout history. Uh, for some people, you are born, baptized into a church. And you are a member of that church. And so people have realized, no, 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 I don't want that. So today, we're going to look at that. Jesus said to his disciples, or to the Jews who believed in him, in John chapter 8, as we saw last week, in John 8, 31, he says to them, if you continue in my teaching, the King James says, if you abide in my word, if you remain in my word, if you put into practice what I have taught you, then you will truly be my disciples. So the mandate of the church, uh, the commandment of Jesus to the church, in the beginning, 
is to make disciples. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, Jesus turns to his disciples before he ascended into heaven and he says to them, all authority, all power has been given to me, both on earth and in heaven. And therefore you, my disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey what I have taught you. So you see the element of discipleship is very linked with teaching. And today, we look at Acts chapter 2, in the beginning of the church, this very principle of teaching and discipleship was started in the, even after the day of Pentecost. So let's read Acts chapter 2 and from verse 40 just to complete. With many words Peter warned them, those who are listening, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted the message of the gospel were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Uh, they were added to their number that day. And verse 42 says, and they, meaning the believers, those who had come to accept the gospel, those who had come to believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus, those who were saved and were baptized, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. I will stop there. And to fellowship and to prayer. You can see that the early church was defined by five things. Fellowship, discipleship, the breaking of bread, And ministry and every church is to be patterned against this so why do you why do you say this because the people were ordered to the church they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching the disciples the apostles could teach the new believers because they had become part of the church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the church belongs to no man, to no person. The church belongs to Jesus. So let me start very, very clearly to say that this church belongs to Christ and it belongs to the worldwide church of Jesus Christ. In that sense, we are all members of one church. Whether we are Roman Catholics, if you are born again, whether you are Baptist, whether you are Pentecostal, Charismatic, the names goes on and on. You don't even know how many names we give ourselves today. But irrespective of denominations, because Jesus did not create denominations, man created denominations to control and rule no matter what denomination you belong or how you became born again you are part of the church of Jesus Christ wherever you go you belong to that church so the church has a universal dimension so I can say as long as I am a disciple of Jesus as long as I am a Christian I am a member of the church and no one can stop me from being a part of the church. 
Because by very nature, by, by my belief, I have become part of the church of Jesus Christ. But belief is within the context also of a local church. So the church has a universal dimension. That if I go to the Philippines, if I go to Ghana, if I go to Nigeria, if I go to America, if I go to Canada, to Bulgaria, to wherever I go, I will belong to the church. I might look for a church which worships like mine. But I am a member of the body of Christ. However, the church also is defined itself in a local sense. For example, you read the book of Corinthians and the Apostle Paul writes to say, to the church of Corinth I write, or to Ephesus I write, or to Philippi I write. So these were local congregations with their own people. And we see here in the book of Acts that those who believe were ordered to the church. They were ordered already to the number of people who were there. On the day of Pentecost, there were about 120 people who had believed. The apostles, their families, and other people who had believed. And they were praying in the upper room. And the Holy Spirit came and Peter in boldness went out and he preached. And people believed. And they said, we have made a commitment to follow Jesus. And talking about commitment, today in our world, the word commitment is a difficult word. Because we live in a world where people do not want commitment. Look at marriages. We live in a world where the individual is boss. Human rights. Individual rights. I am an individual. I have an inherent right to what I want to do. You don't tell me what to do. Nobody can tell me what to do. I have a vote, for example. If I don't like you, I don't vote for you. If you want me, I vote for you. You have to please me. So the individual strength, which is good in, in, in a way, is, is, is excellent. But it has led us to a culture of non-commitment. If my wife and I, or my husband and I quarrel, I look at him and I tell him, I fell in love, I fell out of love with you. I will find somebody else. Look, I don't like it, I'm going to move out. Like a job. Nowadays, I have a market. An employer wants me, I give you my service. I don't like you, I change the service. I find someone else. You make my life a hell of work, I leave you. I want money. I want profit. We live in a world of non-commitment. And believe me, this is beginning to trickle into the church. People want to come to church and enjoy worship, enjoy fellowship, enjoy counseling, but not make a commitment to nobody. If they want to get, they get. If they don't want to get, they move on. This concept of uncommitment is unbiblical. As we see in the book of Acts, the first thing that the new believers did was to devote themselves, was to commit themselves to the teaching, proper teaching, good teaching of the apostles. They submitted themselves Commitment means submission. Devotion means to submit, to voluntarily, to willfully give myself to be taught and to learn from another person about God. And the church is there to teach about God. But if I am not a part of that church, if I am not willing to be questioned, then what do I want to do? 
So we emphasize this year on membership of a church simply because of commitment. When I commit myself to something, I desire to see it work. This church, and believe me, and I say it from all my heart, and I've said this a million times, does not belong to me. I am only a minister in this church with a particular ministry. My ministry as a pastor is not more important than, for example, just to call a name, Juris playing the guitar. Because I don't play guitar. I don't lead worship. My ministry as a pastor teacher is not more important than my son playing the drums. It is a ministry. My ministry as a, as a pastor, as a teacher, is not more important than, for example, I can say that probably last night, it was either Cora or Marlene who washed the toilets. Because before we left here at 8 o'clock, it was in a mess. And this morning it was clean. And the only two people that I guess who, who had to clean our mess is them. Because the first thing I saw this morning was them. And they arranged the chairs back. You should have come here at 9 o'clock in the night. It was a mess. My ministry as a pastor was not more important than them cleaning the church for you to come and sit down this morning. So the church does not belong to one person. It does not belong to a pastor. And therefore, there are people who, who, who think, I go to Pastor Ahmed's church. And I go to people, you don't come to my church. You come to the church where I am also a member of that church. And the commitment for this church to grow to stabilize, to strengthen, does not only lie on my shoulders, but on each and every one. Because each and every one in this room, believe me or not, has a gift from God. Each and every person who believes, who follows, has a gift from God to be used for the edification of the body of Christ. Where is your gift? Where is your spiritual gift? Where is your talent? And so if we have a membership, if I feel that I am part of this body and I want to see this body succeed and I am taught about the things of God, then I will commit myself to the service of God within this local fellowship. So, to make it short, I don't emphasize on membership so that I can go somewhere and raise a flag and say, look at how many members are in my church. I don't want it. I, on I honestly tell you the, the truth. I, I don't, I don't. Because the success of this church, the strength of this church, does not depend on me. It depends on us. Of course, I have an important role to play because I'm the leader. I have to set the vision. I have to guide. I have to teach. I have to sometimes take the, un, the, un, the, the most difficult part of it, of discipline which we have very, very few times. But to tell someone off, it's not easy, it's difficult. And as they say, sometimes I have to do the, the dirty jobs. And I have to have the dirty looks. But it's part and parcel of this community of believers to which you belong and to which I belong. So membership is not sign your name here and I can say to people, you are my church member. Church membership here in the book of Acts means that you are saying, I am going to give myself 
I am going to be added to this fellowship. So if we are five people, we are five. If we are ten people, we are ten. If we are twenty people, we are twenty. And we know the level of commitment of each person. I honestly thank God that on Wednesdays I have given up leading the prayer meetings. It couldn't please me better. Jimmy is here all the time. For over last year, I didn't lead the prayer meetings. I have sometimes come and say to me, Pastor, can you lead because I cannot go? But that is a wonderful thing to have, Jimmy. Know that on Wednesday, rain or shine, there is somebody in the church who will open the place for prayer. And that I don't have to be there. Because I also get headaches. I also get tired. I have a family. I have family responsibilities. I'm a husband. I'm an employer. I'm an employee. Just like you do. Sometimes I wake up and I go, see the way yeah, I have to go to church. <laughs> Feeling. You know, we are all human. We have blood. We have emotions. Some days I wake up smiling. Ha 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 ha. Da 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 singing. And my wife tells me, what fell from the sky? <laughs> and then some days I wake up. You don't dare talk to me. <laughs> Ahmed, what do you want? <clears throat> you know? And then my wife tells me his hormones are, are working at him. <clears throat> do you have those days as well? Or is it only me? Do you have them? Of course you, you have them. You are made of flesh and blood. <laughs> So, you see, we share, we share in the work of God. Huh? Someone has said, I think it was Gandhi, if I quote it wrong, please correct me. But someone said that if, but somewhere, I just saw you, so an Indian illustration came to my mind. But someone said, if you have a million problems and you want to deal as one person, then one person has million problems. But if you have million problems and you, you share the same million problems to a country like India that has got, what, one billion people, then you share that. Guess what? If the load is less. Now, if you share a million problems with million people, you have one problem each. If you share a million problems with one person, one person has one million problems. And the church, by definition, is a place of building. Uh, the church it's a relationship place. First, relationship with God. And that's where teaching comes. We want to this year commit to teaching. Teaching about God. Teaching about the church. Teaching about spiritual gifts. Teaching about ministry and building and empowering people to serve God in a good way. One of the biggest enemies of the church today, the church, not this church, but the church in general, is false teaching. Huh? It is eating the church. There are all kinds of doctrines floating there. All kinds of things being taught. And we need to bring our people to the truth. Remember last week, John 8, Jesus said, If you abide, if you remain in my word, and my word remains in you, 
and you will truly be my disciple and you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free how do you know the truth by teaching so that is why in verse 42 those who believed devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles not everyone in the church can teach not everyone has the authority to teach and again this is the problem today in many places for example where for example where i come from uh, anyone who can teach is a pastor right? it's an apostle it's an evangelist you can hear prophet this and pastor this and apostle this and you can see that is not the name, but it's the responsibility to bring people deeper in truth. Yesterday we were discussing with my brother Collins and, uh, and Bauer, and uh, we, he was telling me about one gospel singer that we like a lot, that we enjoy listening to. And he was telling me, he said, Pastor, do, do you know that this lady has left her husband and has a child with another person and they went on the on radio and they were really getting on each other's throats. Uh, this is not it's something not common. It's common nowadays. That is because we have limited ourselves to the church means to prosper. We don't want deep depth anymore. I was having a walk with a with a young person, a teenager. Pastor Ahmed, how are you? Fine. Can I walk with you? Yes. Let's walk and talk. He said to me, you know, Pastor Ahmed, do you know that God has called us to start the church? I said, God has called you? Yes. And he spoke to me and he said, I said, you? He spoke to you? God spoke to you to start the church. Yes, he said. And you know, I have started this church and you know the, the pressures of ministry. And he's talking to me. He has pressures of ministry. And I'm looking at him and I'm going, wow. May God have mercy on the people who submit themselves to your ministry. And at the end, at the end of our conversation and walking, I asked him, I said, what do you teach people? You know what he said to me? Worship. I teach people how to come into God's presence with worship. What does that mean? The church is pervaded by these things. But you know why? It's because we are a freestyle church. If I don't like to listen to you, if I don't like to commit myself to you, if I don't agree with you, God has called me like he has called you to start a church. Because there is this warped thing.